Hello, kitchen crew. I'm so excited to be invited into your kitchen, I guess, via your laptop. Thank you very much for being on today. I'm very excited also to be bringing you jacket potatoes and gravy. Yes, this is a guilt-free gravy, and I get so excited about this gravy because pretty much I let myself eat as much as I'd like. Oh, just while everyone's getting online and settling in, can you give me a little hello? Let me know that you're on, a um, little wave. Maybe let me know who else is in the kitchen with you as well cooking tonight, if, the, if there is anyone joining you. And then we want to get stuck straight into it. So you may have already noticed with the jacket potatoes that we're going to have about an, potentially an 80 minute bake time. In order to get those potatoes to actually soften down and be beautifully crispy on the outside and, and buttery smooth on the inside, we do like to give them that extra bit of time in the oven to do their work. So what I've done tonight, I'm going to speed up a little bit of the step on my end so that I can finish off the recipe, show you how it all finishes, and then leave you some time at the end to be able to tidy up the kitchen and get ready to eat while your potatoes finish cooking. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump into the jacket potatoes and the gravy again, I'm so excited about. I just, I really wanna show you how to prevent using Gravox is my main motivation with this gravy. I wanna show you how to create flavor from real whole foods. And I do get really excited about it because it is very Moorish in my opinion. And those that I've already shown this recipe to said that it's a complete winner and a total success. So hopefully yours will be the same tonight and you'll learn a little bit about creating flavor within whole foods. Now, when it comes to the jacket potatoes, you may have had a traditional baked potato in the past or a jacket potato. And yes, I too grew up on the traditional baked potato with your sour cream, your cheese, your chives and your bacon bits. And although I did love it at the time, I definitely much prefer this version of jacket potatoes or baked potatoes, simply because my body starts to love it. It, it. it just delights in how it feels at the end. So when I was a kid, I do remember feeling quite heavy, quite lethargic, quite full after a, that version of a baked potato. And I'm not against that. If you wanna have that every now and then, that's perfectly fine. But I'd like to show you another option, another way that you can incorporate more variety of vegetables or other foods into your jacket potato dinner and how we can use a lot of the efficiency tips and tricks I'm going to give you so that this type of meal, even though it might seem like it takes a long time in the oven, you can actually get a lot of other meals prepared in this time without doing a lot of extra work. So that's what I'm going to try to bring across tonight. Let's get those potatoes in the oven. If you haven't already preheated your oven, please get that going onto about 200 degrees, potatoes can handle it a little bit hotter than a cake, for example. So about 200, you could even push it maybe towards 210 degrees Celsius. So let's get that preheated. And then let's get your potatoes or your sweet potatoes out. Let's get them scrubbed. So I'm gonna grab these ones. Like I said before, I have already got some potatoes in the oven because I'm gonna show you how to speed this up. So in the meantime, I'm just gonna do one of each for now. And if you haven't already set yourself up from an organizational perspective, this is something to remind yourself of or something that you can maybe put on a shopping list to go out and find. Now, a big bowl, and this is my smallest of my big bowls, but getting out a big bowl like this when you have a fair amount of vegetables to wash is a great idea. Also because you can be putting in a dash of white vinegar or apple cider vinegar if that's what you, you have. Um, a, a jug of vinegar like this, being that it's a naturally brewed vinegar. So naturally brewed vinegar, that's what we're looking for with this one. If it doesn't have a, 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 I guess, a sign of it being a naturally brewed vinegar, it's basically just acetic acid, which is made in a lab. If we're just washing veggies with it, it's probably not a huge big deal, but I like to get that one. It's only an extra dollar. I think it's $3 for the whole bottle. And I keep it under the sink, not in the pantry, because it's not necessarily food in my opinion. I'm going to use it for washing veggies. Whether your vegetables are organic or not, there's different reasons for using the vinegar, but we definitely want to use it for washing veggies. It just takes off, um, it, it can kill a lot more of the any parasites or anything living in there that we don't necessarily want, uh, and it also will help to strip back to some extent any um, residues or chemical pesticides and things if you have got conventional produce. It's not it's not 100% perfect by any means, but it's definitely better if we give them a good rinse and a good soak in that water. Okay, so we've got our potatoes. So you'll need a roasting tray as well, a baking tray, and you may wanna line it with some baking paper just so that you can 
make your cleaning up a little bit easier. Okay, a little bit of baking paper on that. There we go. And while we're at this step, I would like to just remind you about efficiency. So when it comes to an efficiency step here that you can benefit from, the idea that the oven's going to be on for about 80 minutes anyways, what else can you put in the oven at this time? You're going to have plenty of time with this video. You can pause it at any point that you need. So if you would like at this point to take out some extra vegetables that you can put in the oven and take advantage of the cooking time anyways, then you'll have the extra convenience in the next couple of days for whatever. You don't even need to know what you're going to do with them yet. But if they're cooked, you're much more likely to use them rather than let them go to waste in your fridge. That may even just be cooking extra potatoes or extra sweet potatoes. They can be turned into breakfast for the next couple of days. Once they're cooked, you just slice them up and give them a quick fry in the frying pan in the morning with your eggs or your other breakfast. Or you can mash them up into a dip. You could just have them on a salad. You could make a cold potato salad. I'm pretty sure there's been books written titled something like A Thousand Uses for Potatoes. So I'll let you work that one out. It shouldn't be too hard. Now's your opportunity is my point is to get the extra, extra food into the oven if you've got the space there. So we've got our potatoes. We're also going to get your onions, your garlic, and the mushrooms into the oven at the same time. Now, same deal with the mushrooms. They also get washed. They are grown in mushroom compost is the nice term. Some people like to say a different term that starts with S but that's basically what they're grown in. So even if they're organic, there's still gonna be little specks of dirt on them. And it's nice if we can soak them and get them rinsed. If you ever need to convince yourself of this, do exactly what I'm doing now in a bowl with your water so that when you take them out of the water, after you've given them a little bit of a rub, you can see the color of the water and all the specks that are down below. So generally speaking, we eat enough things that we shouldn't be eating and this is one little step that we can do to reduce, reduce a little bit of that extra dirt load that we would be otherwise eating. <laughs> a few extra variables that eliminates for us and our health. Okay, so mushrooms are there. With your garlic, if ideally if you have a whole bulb like this, we're going to roast that whole. And then when that's fully roasted, all the garlic inside is going to become like a nice soft puree. And then we can just take the bottom off and squish out all the garlic like nature's natural dispenser. And we can have that for the rest of the week as well as extra roasted garlic. It just makes the most amazing addition to any other dish if you want that nice softer garlic flavor rather than the harshness of raw garlic. So I'm just gonna pop the whole bulb on there as is. Maybe you can get out a separate tray for your mushrooms, your onions and your garlic so that we can take them out of the oven sooner. So we've got mushrooms garlic and so you're going to need to put in for this full batch of gravy and I would recommend making the full batch if not doubling it if you already know that you're gonna gonna love this uh, and so you may want to be using much larger trays than that obviously to get all this into the oven and with your onions it can be white onions it can be red onions yellow onions whatever you've got even leeks leeks would make a nice twist on this gravy okay but the onion does give it that savoriness that we're looking for. However, I will state that if you do get a bit of a bitterness to your gravy, it's possibly because we've put too much onion in. So there's this fine line with onion um, or we haven't roasted it long enough. So those are some, some things to look out for. Okay, so as I said before, I'm just doing kind of a little mini version of this because I've already got some stuff in the oven that I'm going to show you the finished product with. So you go ahead and get your three small onions or the equivalent of on there. Roughly 400 grams of mushrooms. It can be anywhere from 25 to 33 this size mushrooms and your clove of garlic. And then on a separate tray, we're going to get the potatoes. Now with the potatoes, all you want to do is spot peel them. So if there's any spot on them that looks like it might go deeper than skin surface, we just do a little spot peel. So we don't need to get rid of any more skin than that. Again, you've paid for the whole weight of that sweet potato. So preferably if it is organic, we want to get all the nutritional benefit out of that skin as well. So we're just kind of spot peeling just as a precaution in case any of the dark spots go deeper than the skin or they're harboring a bit of extra dirt. That's it. 
nice and simple. And then in order to make these look beautiful and pretty on the plate like a jacket potato, I like to do a diagonal cut. So it's just a simple crisscross. You might want to zoom in on this one. All I'm going to do is let the potato find its flat, happy spot, okay? And then we're going to cut on a diagonal, not all the way through, but approximately halfway through the potato. And then about 15 mils apart, you can, you can judge that, it's not really that critical how far. But in this potato, I'm going to get three slices that way, and then three slices in this direction. Just halfway through, very gently so that when the potato cooks, these are naturally going to pull apart and you'll see this beautiful zigzag uh, pattern that we can stuff the sauce in or pour the gravy through and it also helps them to cook through the middle a little bit faster. So we'll do that to the potato as well as the sweet potato. This one, we're going to let it go there. Nice little halfway slice. Being very careful not that the potato doesn't roll on you and accidentally get your fingers. And then a diagonal other way. There we go. So you see that beautiful crisscross pattern? It'll be shown a little bit more easily once we get them out of the oven. Okay, let's bring them over to the oven. Now, if you wanted and if you are doing extra vegetables for other uses, you may want to give a good drizzle of olive oil to this and a good generous sprinkling of salt and pepper or any other herbs that you want to add on top, especially if you're going to be potentially eating them as a standalone vegetable. So a nice generous drizzle of olive oil, salt and pepper, maybe some rosemary, maybe some thyme. We are going to put those types of flavors in the gravy as well. So you might want to get more adventurous and just put hot chili flakes or paprika or cumin, whatever you, whatever is your favorite spice. It, it will help accentuate that flavor when they bake in the oven. Okay, so I'm going to get those into the oven. I'm not going to add any oil to these ones. They're going to be good as it is. And I'm just going to add those potatoes onto the same uh, tray as this one. So let's get that into there. Let's make a little bit of space. Okay, and I'm going to pop the other potatoes in with these ones. All right, and they're looking nearly ready that we can get a move on those ones. Okay, so with those in the oven, if you haven't quite caught up yet, feel free to hit pause on this um, or catch up. If you're watching it live, you can catch up with the, the replay after. Um, but those we've got in the oven. And then the next step is going to be to get our veggies prepared. So the veggies for the salad. And I, I guess I wanna, I wanna be able to show you that we can have raw vegetables on a warm jacket potato with a nice warm sauce over top and it will feel very satiating, very delicious, um, very yummy basically. You won't necessarily feel like you're having raw vegetables if we cut them thin enough and we've got them sitting on a nice hot potato with a nice hot sauce going over top of them. So especially even though it's winter, we can still have this beautiful salad of thinly sliced raw vegetables. Um, over our jacket potatoes to round out the meal, give us the nutrition that our body's really craving. And it almost, I guess you could say, let's say justifies, because there's nothing wrong with eating potatoes. But for anyone that's worried about carbohydrates and potatoes, that's another story for another day. I'm not going to get into that now. Um, but if you're wanting to eat less of the potato, for example, then this is how we do it. We fill the body with the wonderful fiber that is in the raw vegetables and the wonderful nutrition, which is what your body is actually craving. So let's get out the vegetables for this. Um, if you've got, oh, look, there's lots of variation, lots of potential that you can use with this. I like to, to put in some type of onion, so I'm gonna go with the shallots, the green onions, some carrot and some capsicum. We can do some fresh herbs and veggies as well. So let's get those out. Okay. Now, our same washing water, we can still be using if it's not, not too scungy yet. And before you just dump it down the drain, this bowl becomes the very handy rinsing 
bowl, if you will, for all your dirty dishes when you're done. Just chuck them all in before they go in and dirty up your warm soapy water. So it's a nice rinsing bucket for your dishes when you're done. Okay, so capsicum, let's get that in there. Some carrot. We'll give a little rinse to these shallots. Give them a little bath through there. There we go. And while we're at it, I'm not gonna put the broccoli in there just cause there's a bunch of little um, flecks and that's gonna act as like a broom to absorb them. So I'm just gonna give the broccoli a little rinse. And those of you that might be observing other little tricks along the way to make your kitchen life a lot more fun, I've got my scrap bucket here in the sink so that any scraps that I make, I can keep it clean as I work and I just put, pop them into the scrap bucket on the way through. Okay, that's pretty much that. Now, when it comes to the greens, don't expect that you have to have this type of thing. I feel very blessed and very grateful at the moment that my garden is just a green, wonderful, uh, I call it oasis. I love spending time out there. It's, it's wonderful. But I've got some dill that needs to get used up and dill goes really well with potatoes. So I'm gonna put a bunch of dill in this one. Um, I have called for it as an option, but this definitely doesn't absolutely need it. Give that a little clean, give that a little rinse. There might even still be some ants on it, it's that fresh. <laughs> Extra protein. <laughs> okay. And then likewise, um, I've got, what have we got here? We've got some basil that we found in my garden. So that one I'm just going to give a little rinse. Nice basil leaves. No ants. <laughs> oh, it smells so good. Hopefully you're starting to get a bit of smell of vision in your kitchen as well. And some fresh parsley, love a bit of parsley. Let's do that. Look, you can put any greens with this. You could finely chop these kale and the silver beet into it. I am gonna put some of these sorrel leaves in because they are also a very nice addition with potatoes. Sorrel tastes lemony. So if you can get a hold of it, it's hard to find in the shops, I find, um, but it's so easy to grow. It just, I mean, it just looks like spinach, but it's just this really lemony, delicious, beautiful texture. It's very delicate. Um, it's even more delicate than spinach, I find. And it's just, oh, it's one of my favorites. So if you can get a hold of a sorrel plant, sorrel spelled S-O-R-R-E-L. And there's two different varieties. I like the green variety. Okay, so we're gonna get all of that ready for our salad -y mixture, capsicum. And in this case, now that I'm done washing all my veggies, I'm gonna turn that bowl into our salad bowl. So I'm going to put another little bowl in there if I need to do any dishes rinsing. Just going to make that our salad bowl. Even if you don't necessarily present the dish in this bowl, it's nice to have a nice big bowl for doing your mixing because then you don't have to worry about spilling and it's just a lot easier to work with. So we're going to mix our salad in there. Okay. Now, remember how I said that how you cut a vegetable is going to make all the difference in the world to how, to, to someone's perception when they first bite into it. Especially if someone's not a huge vegetable fan to begin with and you're trying a new recipe on them, I would recommend cutting things very thinly. It will help the mouth feel. It will also help the, the sugars to come out of whatever you're, you're cutting. So believe it or not, there's a fair amount of wonderful, delicious sugars in something like a carrot and you get more of it, the finer you slice the carrot. So a lot of kids can handle or will much prefer grated carrot over a big chunk of it, um, just because it actually tastes sweeter. You don't, have to, you don't have to extract the sweetness with your chewing, you can just have it straight away on the tongue. Now the dill is kind of coming towards the end, so the stems are gonna be a little bit tough. So I'm gonna take some of those stems out and just try to keep the leafy, leafy bits. And I'm gonna chop that down nice and fine. Oh, I love dill. So good. I can hear the jokes out there already. <laughs> Only in Australia. All right, extra bits there. Okay, so this is how I would chop my herbs. If you've got all these extra bits of herbs um, and it looks like one big pile, then this is how we do it. We stack everything up and we leave the stems kind of towards the end so we can choose, choose differently with them when we get there. And then we're gonna make a nice little roll so we can tuck everything in. There we go. 
you can fold those ones back. And then we just cut really nice and thin. So nice little slicing action, forward and down. If we were just chopping through, you would be bruising and potentially mushing your greens. So a nice forward action gives you a slice and that will preserve, preserve them longer, keeps them a bit fresher. So you keep squishing the bunch and it makes it easier for the knife to go through. And you can get the edges, however you need to do. And just taking that little bit of extra time with them so that you can get those nice slices. See, look, I told you, oh, I thought that was an ant. <laughs> that fresh. Um, sometimes they get away. Okay, um, so yeah, nice thin slices. This is gonna be really uh, delicate on the tongue when we mix this into a salad. So nice. And as you get to the stems, you can choose. You could leave the stems out. I like to put them in because that's where a lot of the flavor actually is. And if you wanted them to be a little bit more gentle, we can even steam them a little bit when we steam the broccoli. So I'm gonna add those in. Okay, and the rest, Go to my compost anyways. All right, so there's our greens. We can add them to our big mixing bowl or our big salad bowl for now. Clear up some space. And I'm just gonna take one little pause to get those other veggies out of the oven because I'm pretty sure my mushrooms and my onions are gonna be done by now. So bear with me on that one. If you're still catching up, maybe you've got some extra time. Good, yes, okay. So those mushrooms, onions, and garlic are done. Let's leave them out. They shrink quite a bit, you'll notice with the mushrooms. That's why you need a fair few. Okay, next up, let's do some shallots. Same thing applies with the shallots, nice and thin. If we go too fat, you're gonna to get too much of an onion in that bite, and it might put some people off. Here's a quick way to cut shallots. If you've got a nice skinny bunch like this, this applies to celery, this applies to anything that's long and skinny like this, we can cut it down, cut our efforts down into thirds. So let's take that third, we overlap it over that, and then overlap it again. Okay. And then we line them all up, and we can chop them nice and thin. So same concept, we bunch it up, nice thin slices. You could get a little bit fancy, this is getting a little bit, a little bit special, and go on an angle. So I'm not quite in line with the shallots, I'm just on a slight angle. And that's gonna create a different shape, which is actually gonna allow more gravy into them when you pour it over. But they will be slightly larger pieces. So it's entirely up to you. See the difference between that and that, okay? So that's maybe more of a stir fry shape and when we're having them raw, we might wanna keep them nice and small in that shape. So just, just to prove the point that it does make a difference how you cut it. Okay, so I'm gonna keep with a nice thin slice there. And again, the same thing applies when it comes to efficiency in the kitchen. So if you can do a little bit of forethought as to what's coming up in the next couple of days, while you're cutting vegetables, can you cut, do you need to cut extra shallots? Are you gonna be having maybe an omelet for breakfast in the morning? And you could just nicely sprinkle some of these conveniently chopped up shallots into your omelet in the morning um, to make that possible, to make it more doable. So any extras, there's always another use, very easy. These are very strong shallots. Bear with me while I cry with you. Okay. Now, one thing I want to point out, and please zoom in on this one. This is where I see a lot of people stop. Okay. Now, yes, I do understand that the onion gets stronger as you get towards the white end. But look how much waste there is here. It's really only the roots we don't want to eat. So if you're used to throwing away these bits of the onion, do chop them up. They don't have to go raw into your salad, okay? But let's try and get all the way to the roots. Again, not only have you paid for it, but it saves, it saves all the waste that we tend to experience otherwise. 
Okay, and then these, if they're clean enough, could also go into your container that lives either in the fridge or the freezer that you'll be making your broth with, your stock. Okay, so that's another option. In this case, I'm composting them tonight as I cry through it. Don't cry for me, Argentina. Um, okay, now um, again, if you don't want to put those really strong oniony bits into the gra into the salad roll, we can put them into the gravy and just give them a little cook so that they're not as strong. I'm going to leave them in the salad because I love a little bit of extra onion with that. And then we'll clear the air of the onion acid <laughs> and move on. How's everyone going? Have we made jacket potatoes before? Any questions so far? Oh, look, we've got, yes, awesome. How's everyone going? I, I appreciate that you guys might still be catching up with everything because I left you a bit short on the potatoes, but if you want to um, type it in, do so, and then I can always come back to that and, and make sure I don't forget, your, forget to answer your question. Okay, capsicum. I probably should, I'll do this next time. I'll show you another way to cut capsicum. There's some cool, cool fun tricks we can do with capsicum. So all I did there was slice around the, I guess the bum of the capsicum around the bottom. And then I just went around the stem. So did a little cut like that so that when I break it open, all I have to do is break that extra section off and that comes off easily. And then we can go in for the seeds and the white bits if you don't want the white bits. There we go. We do want to try and remove the seeds. The intestines do not love the seeds. So the white bits, less important, but seeds definitely. There we go. Okay, now keeping in mind mouthfeel. How is it when you bite into a big piece of capsicum like that? Especially if you had it on a fork full of a whole bunch of other veggies and your big, big piece of potato and your gravy. This would be quite overpowering in the mouth as a flavor. Okay, so the point here is thinking about how it feels in the mouth in how it's going to be eaten. This piece, however, on top of a pizza that was getting well kind of roasted on top of the pizza might be really delicious because you'd want to get that extra capsicum hit. Okay, so just have a think about how you'd like to bite into it. Personally, with this jacket potato salad, I'm gonna to try to keep the pieces fairly small. So what I'm even going to do is I'm going to slice them into their nice thin strips, but then I'm also going to cut them a few ways, crossways as well. Some of you may have been taught to cut capsicum face down because it's stable, more stable, but I find that unless your knife is super, super sharp, it's more likely to kick because it's hard to cut through the capsicum skin if your knife isn't super sharp. So that's why I'm doing it like this. It's a lot easier for your knife to go into it and this side of the capsicum. bit safer. Okay. So there's, it's funny how many ways people probably have of doing things and it's not until you see someone else do it that you go, oh, never thought of doing it that way. So likewise, if you cut the capsicum really different than what I just did, please let me know. It's really good to have that perspective. Okay, so like I said, I just want slightly tinier pieces. So I'm just, I'm gonna give this a good dice. So nice tiny pieces. I kind of want the capsicum mostly for the color as opposed to a nice, as opposed to a big chunk of it in a bite. So nice little bit of color here. Hello Monique, thank you for your question or your comment. And I love jacket potatoes too. <laughs> um, have you had jacket potatoes in this way before, Monique? Would love to know that. I'm sure there's a bazillion different ways you can have them. So I'd like to know your favorite toppings. I ummed and awed about showing you also how to make a cashew sour cream because that's another favorite ingredient that I put on jacket potatoes. But I promise I'll save that for another, another recipe that will come. At this point, I have way too many recipes that I want to teach you. I'm already out scheduled until like next year, end of next year, um, so I can't wait. But I would love your feedback to let me know what you'd like to learn and also to let me know if, yeah, if there's a certain recipe that you would like to come, come first, because at this point it could be who knows when. I've got so many in line. All right, a little bit of a 
carrot peel if you need to. You, you absolutely do not need to. I'd rather keep the skin on. Um, so sometimes that's just done out of habit. Up to you. You can make that decision on the carrot. And with carrots, they tend to oxidize and go brown. If you really don't like brown carrots, and I would agree with you to, to keep that color nice and bright, we could have a little bit of a lemon, a half a lemon on hand, just to give it a squish once we're done chopping it. Now you could grate the carrot, or we can use a mandolin, or we could use a julienne peeler. So I'll just show you that one quickly. The julienne peeler looks like a normal peeler, but it's got these little extra blades, extra little cutting blades. So what that results in are these nice thin strips, which are a little bit bigger than grating it. So if you are saving this salad for the next couple of days, this, cut, this type of cut will actually last longer than grated carrot, because grated carrot will tend to release more juices and it will feel a bit more mushy or soggy much faster. So this is kind of one of my favorite ways to have carrot uh, in a salad, especially, especially with those nice warm potatoes, hot potato and the gravy on top. When you get towards the end, it gets a little bit tricky. It, you benefit kind of from having nails and keeping it flat on the board. But you just kind of do your best with that little knobby bit. It's nice to keep the actual end bit before you chop it off so you have something else to hold on to and prevents more waste. And then hopefully you can snack on the little bit at the end so that doesn't go to waste. Okay, so we've got our julienne carrot. Like I said, you could give this a little squish with some lemon juice to make sure it stays nice and bright. There, that's about as good as I'm gonna, good as I'm gonna get. So eat that bit, don't waste it. <laughs> I'm gonna compost it, but normally I would eat it, I promise, I just wanna keep talking to you. Okay, there's our carrot. Little squish of lemon juice if you've got that on hand. I'll be the experiment and I'll do it without lemon juice and we'll see how it goes. Some carrots for some reason oxidize faster than others. I don't know if it has to do with the variety or the freshness of them, not sure. If anyone's got that scientific answer, would love that feedback as well. Okay, so that's our carrot capsicum. We've got our greens in there. Next little bit, this is fairly simple. This is gonna be our basic salad. So this is the little bit, this is actually looking quite Christmassy. Um, this is going to go on top of the hot potato. And then we've got this yummy smashed pea, kind of like a dip that I wanna show you for making it even more meal rounded and feeling extra special. But before we get into that, I'm just gonna quickly chop up the broccoli so that we can get that ready to steam when we get those peas cooking or warming basically. When I'm feeling very lucky and when it's the time of year that fresh garden peas are available at the markets, then I do make, take the time to sit down and with a good, <laughs> a good movie on and shell a bunch of peas to freeze. But if that doesn't, um, if that's not possible for you and I totally understand, then you can normally get organic frozen peas fairly easily at either a health food store. Even some of the supermarkets are now carrying organic peas as well. Okay, that's my first um, potato timer, so bear with me two seconds. Just let that keep going. And we'll finish the broccoli. Try to eat as much of the stem as you can. A lot of the flavor and a lot of the nutrition is in the stem and I see so many people throw it away. It's so good for you and so sweet. Yes, if there's tough bits, you'll feel it when you cut it with the knife, so you don't have to include those, but for the most part, try to get that stem into you. Nice thin slices. The more we cut into the broccoli like that, the easier this comes apart without making a mess of the florets and chopping them. I like the look of a, of a complete tree rather than a sliced tree with a clear edge. Just a little technical thing. Okay, there's that. So while we've got our mushrooms ready to go and um, the onions and the garlic and everything ready, we can move on to the dressing or to the gravy. So I'm going to take you through that now. Obviously, if yours are not fully cooked yet, I, I understand. Um, I wanted to show you this first so that you can maybe watch it before you do it, and then when we finish this and I show you how the finished product is presented, then you have time to, like I said, straighten up the kitchen or get more meals prepared while the kitchen's a mess anyways. 
and then when your potatoes are done, you'll be ready to plate up, and it's super easy from that point. Okay, so come on over, let's make some gravy. All right. Now, you will need either a blender or a food processor that's a fairly good food processor. Um, anything, maybe anything other than like a, a Thermomix or a Bellini or, or the ones that are very much like the, the Thermomix design. They might not be designed to get things pureed really, really smooth. Most traditional food processors are designed just to chop it without actually blending it. So you'd probably be happier in this case with a nice smooth gravy. You don't want lumps in your gravy. So we might need a, a blender for this case. And we are going to be putting some potentially uh, hot liquids in there as well. So just as a, as a heads up to choose your blender. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to be doing this in the Thermomix. Um, and what I'm going to show you as a step leading up to this. If you're not using the Thermomix and you don't have an ability to kind of heat within there, I'm going to show you a little trick that we're going to use to do three things at once. Okay, it's old school, as in it involves, this is called a steaming basket. <laughs> um, nowadays, it's unfortunately not common. Um, we won't go into that. Okay, so what we need is a, a saucepan, a steaming basket, and a lid. And then down the bottom, we're going to put the liquid. If you've got the frozen stock from your freezer, because you're starting to get organized and you're getting a flow on, the frozen stock that we've pulled out of the, the little containers, into the bottom as our boiling liquid that we're going to steam the broccoli with. Okay, so that goes into the bottom as our steaming liquid. We're kind of killing two birds with one stone here, um, or as my sister-in-law likes to say it, we're getting two birds stoned at once. Um, and we can not only create the steam, but we're going to also thaw the frozen peas at the same time. So like I said, these are some organic uh, frozen peas that I've got. I'm going to put them in with this. Okay, and they will get a little bit extra cooked, but we're going to use that to steam that. And then into the top, we'll put the broccoli. So let's get that happening now, unless you really want your broccoli to be just steamed right at the time that you're going to eat it. Then leave that for the last step. You'll have to do one little extra step, but that's okay. So I'm just going to put the broccoli into here, and we're going to come straight back to this. Bear with me two seconds. If you are doing this all in the Thermomix, you may need, you'll either need more time or, you're, or you'll need two jugs, okay, for the Thermomix. So if you're doing that exact equivalent in the Thermomix, you'd be putting the stock or the frozen broth down the bottom of the jug. You'd be putting the peas in this basket, and then you'd be putting the broccoli in the steaming basket up top. Okay, so that's how we do that but then we would obviously need to empty that if you're gonna make the gravy in there after. So, all good, up to you. Because I used to call this gravy grandma's gravy, I'm gonna do it the way grandma did it, just so you can show you the, the ropes. Okay, so we're gonna turn that one on to full heat. Uh, that should be good. Let's leave that one on there. Okay, so full heat, that can start happening while we get everything ready for the blending of the gravy. Okay, everyone with me so far? Let me know if you have anything you, wanna, you want me to repeat or you want me to slow down on. I'm teaching you a lot in this one recipe. I know it may seem straightforward that we're making jacket potatoes and gravy, but I wanna show you how to make it so easy and to do other things at once so you start to love your time in the kitchen because you, you're smarter about it, you're more efficient about it, whatever that may be. Okay, so coming back to the gravy steps. Let's measure everything else into there, and then we blend it all up. It's pretty much that straightforward. So we've got our roasted mushrooms. They're all gonna go in. Okay. Whoops, <laughs> flying mushrooms. The reason why this recipe is based on the mushroom is because the mushroom is actually high in natural glutamates, not monosodium glutamates or extracted forms of glutamates, but in its natural form, whole food glutamates, which is what our tongue loves as the umami savory flavor. So it's really good for you in its natural form. It's only when we create an extract or an, ex 
uh, a singular, singularized form of the glutamates that it becomes a neurotoxin in the brain. So big difference, okay? These are natural whole food based glutamates and that's what's going to create a rich savory gravy flavor. That being said, if you do have an allergy to mushrooms or you can't, you just can't do mushrooms for anything other than taste and bear with me. I've had a lot of mushroom haters love the gravy as long as they didn't know up front that there was mushrooms in it. Um, so if you, if you have any other reason other than taste to avoid them, I haven't done a lot of experimenting with other vegetables, but I have been in discussions with one of you kitchen crew with the lovely Julie about how we could do this instead of mushrooms. So we'll possibly get back to you with some other options on that one. She's going to do some other testing. I was thinking we could get away with some well roasted eggplant as another option, but we'll work on that one. Okay. All the onions, nice little bit of charring on there is going to give us a bit of extra flavor. And with our garlic, depending on how well they've been cooked, we can either peel them apart easily and get that, get that piece as a standalone piece without that little knobby bit. Okay. Or if it's really well mushed, then you might actually just have to take it and squish it out. So that just depends on how it's been cooked. There we go. Okay. So if you were doing raw garlic and you forgot to roast the garlic, you probably only want to put maybe a clove, maybe a clove and a half in unless you were going to cook it a fair bit once it was in. So garlic is very different from its raw state to its cooked state. Because I want a, quite a nice roasted garlic gravy, I'm going to use these four massive cloves of garlic, but they've been well roasted. So it'll mild it, mild it down, tame it down a bit. All right, bear with me while I rinse my fingers and we can move forward with that. Okay. Now we just have to add the rest of the ingredients into the gravy and blend away. So we've got our stock reducing down there. And now I want to make sure that we get all the other flavor bits. And I want to show you how we're going to be putting in specific ingredients that you may at first think, Oh, I don't want it to taste like balsamic vinegar. But the key and what I'm trying to show you here is that if we get everything in balance, you won't be able to pick any one ingredient that we've added, but you'll just taste it and go, wow, I can't describe that, but that's amazing. So the intention is not to put so much in that all of a sudden you can taste balsamic vinegar. For example, we're going to start with two teaspoons. You may need a little bit more, but in this case, start by exactly measuring so that you have a reference point. So two teaspoons of balsamic vinegar. If you only have glaze, that's all right. And if you don't have any balsamic vinegar, you could be using some red wine. Um, the red wine, you could possibly double or triple the amount if you're using the red wine and you want to have a good night. <laughs> okay. Olive oil, basically because it's a good oil and it's fairly traditional, you could use a natural sesame oil as in not a, not a toasted sesame oil, uh, or you could get away with, I guess, any other flavor that you felt you wanted to include. Olive oil is definitely my favorite here. So three good tablespoons of that. Even I find it funny that I have to refer to my own recipe because oftentimes I'll just get in and just add it all in, but I want to sh show you how to follow the recipe. All right. Two to three teaspoons of tamari or miso paste. Now these two ingredients are some of my favorite I don't want, they're not really even sneaky tricks, but they're pretty much whole food options at adding flavor. So instead of using stock powder, and I promise you, I find a tin of this particular brand of stock, stock powder in everyone's pantry that I go into in Australia. And it's just, it's, it's how I feel most people are taught how to create flavor in a dish is to add stock powder. But unfortunately, even the organic stock powders have maltodextrin in it, which is a derivative of MSG. So I don't like using that as you are probably well aware. Uh, so we're going to go for some tamari and or miso paste. Now one tablespoon is the equivalent of three teaspoons. I've already got this one dirty. I'm just going to go a little bit less than full to start out with. Okay. So that was two teaspoons. You could go three or we can save that last one at the end to be an adjuster. And I've said, and or the miso. So you could, uh, actually I've just said, or you could do and, <laughs> but we'll taste it before we add that in. This is, I guess if you needed anything to be uh, an equivalent 
um, stock paste, think of miso as your stock paste. Think of miso when a dish just needs a little something something and you can't put a finger on it. However, if you go to the effort of buying a good quality, high quality um, organic unpasteurized miso, we don't really want to cook it because then we're destroying a lot of the living benefits from it. This is a living food. It's a fermented living food. Not the end of the world if you need to use it in a pinch for flavor, but that's another option that you have. Okay, then we need three to five tablespoons of nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast, not active yeast. This is very different. This is very high in vitamin Bs and it has a bit of a cheesy flavor, but in this case we're going to use it to bring out and accentuate sort of that umami flavor that we want in the gravy. So I'm just going to go four big tablespoons for now. And then our herbs or spices. So I don't know about you, but traditionally whenever I had gravy, it was either with roast, beef, or chicken. Generally speaking, I preferred the chicken gravy, and that normally came with the spices of rosemary, sage, and thyme which is just what I grew up with. You may have had totally different spices in your gravy. But for me, when I think of gravy, I think of those three spices. So it's up to you whatever spices you want to put in. Maybe yours was always garlic and chili. Maybe yours was always paprika and, you know, some other, I don't, I don't know what. But for me, I just, I love the bit of rosemary. Thyme and sage are my main, main ones. Okay, so again, if you're not sure, start with less, see how it tastes, and add more. That's how easy cooking is. With the rosemary, because I've got this really quite fine, I'm, I'm gonna start with a quarter of a teaspoon, maybe a little bit more than that. So a quarter of a teaspoon of the rosemary. I think I probably could have got away with a bit more than that. Thyme, I just refreshed, refilled my thyme. That smells amazing. I'm gonna go a half a teaspoon of that. And sage, sprinkle, sprinkle. Little big sprinkle sprinkle or fresh sage if you've got it okay now if you want pepper we can do some pepper or some hot chili peppers if you like a spicy gravy and let's leave the salt to the end we chances are we're going to need to add a fair amount um, to this but I'd like you to have a taste to see how these flavors develop okay moving right along uh, let's get this blended knowing that we don't have our liquid in there yet See how things are going down here. Good. So it's melted. We just haven't quite got to the boiling point for steaming yet. So I'm going to leave a little bit of that in there. Uh, let's do a preliminary blend and see what we can achieve without liquid first. Okay. And while that's happening. Because I'm feeling a little bit impatient, I'm actually going to take that liquid off now and we're going to use uh, we're going to use that stock and I'm going to replace it with water. Okay. So I'm just going to take that broth out so I can use it. Those peas are already done. They just needed to be thawed. So I'm just going to put a little bit of water in this to finish boiling the broccoli. Okay, so if you already were doing that extra step anyways, then you're one step ahead of us. So we don't need a lot of water to boil it, we just don't want it to boil dry. Okay. All right, so we'll let that continue doing its thing. We've got our warm broth into the gravy. and then we'll give it a good blend. So like I said, you probably don't want to end up with a chunky gravy. So let's just check on this one, see how we go. And okay, so it's going to need a little bit more work, a little bit more blending. And this is where it's entirely up to you. 
So depending on how long you've cooked your mushrooms or how many mushrooms you had, how much stock you actually put in, this is going to vary dramatically no matter how accurate you've been with the recipe, simply because of the nature of mushrooms and um, liquid moisture absorption. Okay, so see how that's gone quite thick, quite thick on us. So in this case, if you haven't got extra stock thawed, that's perfectly fine. We're gonna keep adding water and or non-dairy milk. So if you've got some soy milk on hand, that would be nice and neutral. Um, if you've got almond milk, you could probably get away with a bit of that if you wanted it to be creamy. I'm just gonna add a little bit of extra water to this. Okay, and then we're gonna taste it so that we can adjust the seasoning. Just right. Okay. So this is where you learn to adjust on the fly and not need a recipe. Dun, 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 dun. Come on, okay. So much better texture now, but still a little bit a little bit lumpy. This will make a huge difference depending on whether or not you're using a food processor or a blender. So when I do this exact recipe in my blender, it does get it that extra little bit smooth. So we're going to, and I might, I should probably prove those words to you and do it, do it as well, but have a taste and let's get the taste right first. Okay. So we're tasting for saltiness, we're tasting for the richness of the gravy flavor. Like I said before, if you're getting a little bit of bitterness, that could be the onion. It could be um, too much onion or too much burnt bits on top, but that's, that's okay, we can, we can work with that. Chances are, because we haven't added any salt yet, it's gonna taste fairly so-so. Okay, so let's add some salt. I believe I have called for, just to taste, um, you'll probably need to add about half a teaspoon to this amount, or you can add more tamari, which is quite salty, or a little bit of miso. So in this case, why not? Let's add maybe half a teaspoon, half a teaspoon of miso. Give that another blend. And the other thing to keep in mind is that gravy always tastes better hot. So if you've used the cold water or the not so, or your veggies have cooled down, uh, we're not gonna benefit from that, that heat and it does taste much better hot, and it can also taste better the next day. So one more little blend. Okay, so same sort of consistency, just a little bit, a little bit smoother there. I'm gonna have another taste, see how we go for flavor. Okay, that's, um, I think that's, that's pretty accurate for my taste buds. I'm definitely getting the sage, I'm getting a little bit of the rosemary. Um, so if you're not quite getting enough of that, then that's something you could add a little bit more of. If you're getting too much flavor, don't forget that it's going to be needing to carry that flavor through the salad, through the potato. So we do want it, when we taste it on its own, we want it to be slightly stronger in flavor than, when, than how it's gonna feel once we have it on the dish. Okay, now I kinda wanna do a bit of an experiment here and show you the difference between this and the blender um, as far as texture goes, okay? So just a question here. Uh, something you substitute the miso and tamari or would they be fine to omit? Good question, Neve. So um, to substitute the tamari or the miso, probably it's gonna be extra salt. Uh, we may have a bit of a flavor lack potentially there. Um, what else could you use without the miso or the tamari? 
I'd probably focus on adding more of the spices, more of the, the salt, and just know that it might be lacking a little bit of that rich gravy umami flavor, okay? So as a substitute for those ones. Um, and or you could add more mushrooms as well. That will increase that, okay? Okay. Um, would everyone be okay if I took an extra second or so to get this into the blender? I want to show, I want to show the difference in the blender. Bear with me two seconds. This is a bit of a, an on-the-fly thing. We can because we're live. You guys can monitor the steaming broccoli and I'll be right back. <laughs> that broccoli going okay pulling out the blender the big guns not that I don't love my Thermomix it's very amazing but when it comes to gravy I don't want lumpy gravy and it's not like I would still happily dig into that that's perfectly fine but if you're sitting there going that doesn't look like gravy this could be why so I just wanted to show to see what the difference is and I'll save some so that we can compare. Okay. My kitchen, I can do that. <laughs> oh, yum. Okay. Got it everywhere. <laughs> okay. How'd we go? So much smoother consistency, quite pourable. And if you wanted it more liquidy, obviously we'd keep adding the water till we got it. Okay. Um, I'm even going to push this one, like one more second or one more lot of 35 seconds. See what that thing's got. Broccoli's done. Great question, Lorraine. So as far as spoons in your measuring set, one says a tablespoon is 15 mils and one says 25 mils. Technically in Australia, a tablespoon is 20 mils, but for the rest of the world, it's 15. So I use 15 mils as my standard one. It's just, I find easier to, to buy a set that's 15 mils as a tablespoon, okay? Um, so that's, that's the one I use. 25 is quite large. I've never heard of a 25 mil tablespoon. Um, that would be the equivalent of sort of one and a half tablespoons. Um, so yes, so yes, you can use the 15 mil would be preferred as far as getting a recipe correct on the first go. Okay, all we need to do now with our, well, let's do a side-by-side -side comparison here with the gravy so I can give you the full perspective. And again, Keep in mind, this is going to be much better. Now we're going to take this and, and reheat it so that it's nice hot gravy when you go to eat it. Preferably, you'll put it in a saucepan, put the lid on, and leave it simmer over a longer period of time while your potatoes finish cooking. Leave it on, say, maybe three, the heat of three, and leave the lid on so it can, can finish cooking without burning or scorching. So a bit of a smoother consistency there. Okay. Maybe not the most appetizing thing on its own by looks, I, I get that, but when it comes to saving your health, if you want to make this more kind of oily and shiny looking like a gravy, then you can definitely add more oil, okay? So add more olive oil. I would probably even recommend that at the end before you serve it, you add some flaxseed oil, which will then contribute 
more omega-3s to your diet and not just omega-6s. Okay, so I've got a nice little healthy mess going on there. We're going to take our thawed peas, put them in a bowl, and then we're going to mash the avocado through that. If you didn't want fully mashed peas, mash the avocado first and then add the peas in. I'm going to go for gold. Okay, so coming back to our avocado. And then we're nearly ready to eat. Okay. I like to use a spoon for this. So these have got really soft skins. I think these are called Shepperton um, avocados, very soft skin, so it's easy to slice through it. So I'm going to be a bit more careful. Put that in with the peas. Make sure you don't throw any of that away. And I've called for two avocados because you may find that you absolutely love this little component. You, I even sometimes eat it with corn chips. <laughs> Um, but it's basically like a smashed pea slash guacamole. Smashed pea guac. And for me, it gives those extra healthy fats to the dish um, and a bit of that richness that you might be missing if you normally have jacket potatoes with either bacon or a big chunk of roasted steak or something roasted meat with it. So I'd love you to try and enjoy this meal as a fully vegetarian meal if that's a new thing to you. I'm just going to put a little touch of salt in there. You could even put a little bit of lemon, and then we're going to make a smashed pea. Again, if you want to keep a little bit of that texture, we can take out some of those peas, and we'll stir them in after so that we preserve some of that extra texture. Otherwise, it'll look like one big guac. There we go. This is quite a fancy thing. If you go to a restaurant or a cafe for breakfast in the morning and they've got smashed pea on the menu, it may not have avocado in it, but it's, they can charge a fair amount for it. <laughs> so now you get to be this gourmet chef at home, really simply. So I'm mostly focusing on mashing the avocado, leaving some of those peas intact. And depending on your flavor preferences, you can, or texture preferences, you can take this as far as you like. I like a bit of texture still left in this, so I'm going to call that good. Okay. And as far as making this meal into a quicker, faster option, you won't be doing as much talking as I've been doing. <laughs> and once you've done it a couple of times, you'll have, you'll have the groove on. The other thing you can do is make a double or triple batch of your gravy and freeze it into portions in the freezer so all you have to do is thaw it and then you're ready to eat the gravy. And same goes with um, this mixture. You can use it for other things throughout the week. So maybe you could have made this mixture yesterday and, um, and had it on your dinner tonight if you needed to speed things along. But I think while we've got that 80 minute timer in the oven, we might as well take advantage of making as many other parts of meals as we can while the dishes are happening anyways. I call it three for one. Try to get three meal prep efforts or three parts of meals done every time you come in for one kitchen session. Three for one, it'll save you a lot of time. Everyone likes getting a three for one deal. Okay, now we get to assemble our yummy jacket potatoes. But keep in mind, I would like you to reheat your gravy before you do it. I'm going to speed things along so I can show you how it's done and then you can continue doing your thing. But uh, it is much better with really hot gravy. Okay, here we go. Let's bring over all of our pieces. How nice those look now that they've been baked, they've separated into their shapes. Love that. All right, so if you're having a sweet potato, we can put that on the plate. You could separate them a little bit if you wanted to put the 
salad within that, but I'm going to keep a nice big pile of salad right beside because I love this stuff. Okay, a couple of bits of broccoli. Looks pretty hot, so I'm just going to dig in here. Nice steaming broccoli. Something you probably want to get the timing right on, otherwise it'll go cold. We don't love cold broccoli. And then our nice little dollop of our smashed pea and avocado. You could put extra seasoning in, seasoning in that. You could put some lemon juice, some extra salt and pepper to make that taste good on its own. And then once you've heated your gravy, let's put a nice generous bit of that with our potato. Enough so that you can really enjoy that flavor and also put a little bit on your salad. Keep your salad nice and um, sauced up as well. Wow, that's quite a huge plate. <laughs> that one's going to be not for me. <laughs> and there we have it. So the jacket potatoes with your grandma's gravy or your real guilt-free gravy. I would say personally I'd feel comfortable to eat as much of that as I'd like in a sitting rather than feeling guilty that I'm eating too much oil or too much fat or too much of that. If you are still making your gravy from the, the drippings from roast and you're still having the roast meats, that's absolutely fine. That can add more flavor to this as well. But then hopefully you can boost your gravy with the, I guess the bulk of it being the mushrooms and the onions and the garlic and that type of thing in addition to that. So it kind of balances out a, out a little bit. So I'd love to hear how you go. How does it taste? How do you feel afterwards? If you are giving this a fair crack and you aren't having it with any other cheese or sour cream or meat or anything like that, let me know. I'd love to hear your, your responses, your reactions. How did your gravy go? Um, it's, it's different every single time we make it and I've made that hundreds of times. So what I'd like you to get out of that is particularly how to create the flavors and then you'll see how your, your best way to make the texture that you desire is. So other than that, thank you for cooking with me. I hope your potatoes are nearly done and you're ready to eat. Otherwise, you've got some time to do some dishes in between and be done and dusted when you eat dinner. Thank you, and we'll see you next time on Cook With Me.